ASCO members around the globe, a good morning. Uh, this is uh, Steve Grubbs. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Affairs at ASCO, and I want to welcome you to another session of the ASCO Global Webinar Series titled Cancer Care Experiences and Lessons During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, today's uh, topic is actually a new venue for us, which is case presentation. And today's topic is management of lung cancer patients with COVID-19. Next slide. Please note that the presentations and answers to questions about COVID-19 presented in these webinars are provided by the American Society of Clinical Oncology for voluntary informational use by our providers. This information is not intended to substitute for independent professional judgment of the treating provider in the context of treating an individual patient or developing practice policies and procedures. Next slide, please. So just to remind everyone, uh, this webinar series has been active since uh, the onset of the pandemic, at least in the United States, back in, in mid-April. Uh, we now have uh, changed from a weekly webinar to a monthly webinar series, which occurs on the last Tuesday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern time in the United States. Uh, sessions last anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes. Now, there are a number of previous, previous webinars that you can see on this slide weekly starting at April 14th through May 5th, and then monthly in June and July. These webinars, which were absolutely outstanding, are recorded and posted on ASCO's YouTube channel with the address that you can see on this slide. So if you did not get a chance to see any of those, it's worth your while to go back and check them out. They were out just outstanding. Next slide. So joining me today in really, uh, it says collaborator, but our other host is Mr. Doug Pyle, who is the Vice President of ASCO's International Affairs uh, um, Department, and he will be doing the wrap-up at the end of uh, today's uh, webinar. Next slide, please. So it is my true pleasure to be able to introduce uh, our moderator today, Dr. Clarissa Mathias from Brazil, who will be uh, introducing all of our speakers today. Clarissa, please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here for this joint session between ASCO and ISLC. Um, I would like to thank the organizing uh, committee from ASCO and our group that has been involved in that. And it's my great honor to present uh, our speakers today starting with Dr. Marina Garacino. Marina is from uh, is a medical oncologist from the division of the National Cancer Institute of Milan. Um, Dr. Warren Graham, who is a radiation oncologist, vice chairman of core research, radiation oncology department, Medical University of uh, South Carolina. Carl Therian, who is Brazilian, and he's a radiologist at University of Manchester in UK. Dr. Pramash, who's the director of Tata Memorial Hospital, and he's a professor and head of thoracic surgery, division of surgical oncology at Tata Memorial Center. And Dr. Shu Yang Xiao, professor of pathology at the University of Chicago, China, USA. So it's our great honor to have all of you here today. And uh, it's a different format. We are actually going to present cases and have discussions still Please feel free to send in questions and inquiries about cases or related to management of COVID-19 and lung cancer. Um, next slide, please. To ask a question, please post in the WebEx question and answer box. It is unlikely that we will be able to address all questions in the webinar. We will incorporate questions and feedback received into our respective uh, coronavirus resource pages. Next, please. So let's start with the um, case presentation. Next, please. So the case number one is um, actually our case. 
is a um, male, 64-year-old, ECOG zero, former smoker, who developed cough and hematuris for three weeks, and he had a chest EG that showed a 9 by 7.7 left mass with no lymph nodes uh, greater than one, uh, 10 millimeters. He had a past medical history uh, positive for hepatitis C with no liver dysfunction that was actually cured. And a CT guided perticanus biopsy showed an adenocarcinoma. Next, please. So we have the uh, chest CT, and I would like to call in Klaus to comment on that. Klaus? Can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Good. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much for, for having us, uh, the, the, the participation here. So we are trying to be quite brief, so we have time enough for questions there if you want. So you can identify on these uh, axial slices a large, muscle with a small necrotic center but without cavitation, which is in basically centered in the lower lobe. Uh, uh, as you're going to see these and in other slides there, uh, measures almost 10 centimeters in, in length, which is a big size. Uh, it's encasing one of the branches of the pulmonary artery, but there is no signs of invasion of the medial spinal, and there is no conclusive sign of invasion of the chest wall on these uh, two slices here. Uh, also in these two slices, you see that they, the, the artery although uh, surrounded by soft tissue density, is not occluded. Okay. Next slide, please. So you can identify on the sagittal view that the, the oblique fissure is here, and then you can perceive uh, the uh, indentation of the uh, tumor against the oblique fissure. And that's another important thing that about size of the lesion, yeah, since we are talking uh, about the TNM staging here, when you you need to measure the longest diameter of the lesion, and in this patient, uh, the longest diameter is actually in the sagittal view rather than in the axial view. So it's, uh, it's probably it's just above 10 centimeters, uh, which doesn't make much difference because by if it's bigger than seven, it's already a T4 in terms of size. Uh, you can perceive that there is no obvious extension into the upper loop, uh, and there is no obvious pleural fusion at least in these two images that we have provided. Next slide, please. Uh, so, the 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 yes. All yours. Do you like yeah. to, would you like to comment? Uh, do you want <laughs> to continue? To, yeah, I can, yeah. So you see, you see that the, most of the lesion, apart from that necrotic center, is showing a very avid uptake of an SUV max of 12.6 which is very high, yeah, showing that the prognosis of this patient is limited, uh, not only by the size of the lesion, uh, which is a T4, but also an indication on the SUV that this has a poor prognosis uh, usually. Yeah. And uh, next slide, please. Next, please. Okay, so uh, thank you, Klaus, very much. So we have a nine centimeter lateral lobe adenocarcinoma that showed no abdominal lymph nodes or distant metastasis. CNS had no metastasis. So we were, we had a clinical T4 and zero and zero. So Marina, uh, what would you do at this time? So we were in the, May, in the middle of the pandemic uh, three months ago, and um, he was very clear the hospitals were packed. So what would you do for this case? Marina, can you? Yes. Okay. Can you? Okay, sorry. So I, I think that in these cases, uh, it's really important to discuss uh, uh, patient by patient. So I think that there is not uh, a solution for uh, everyone, and uh, you have to discuss uh, with the patient that uh, the patients are in particular with lung cancer, are at higher risk uh, if they develop COVID-19 to die. And so every decision must be taken uh, um, uh, deciding with the patients uh, what to do. 
So maybe in this case, uh, um, the, we would have started uh, the, the treatment, uh, but again, uh, after a long discussion with the patient. Uh, Thank you, Marina. So next, please. That's actually what we did. So we had a, an invasive, um, a multidisciplinary meeting. So we decided to do an invasive, um, we were discussing between invasive mediastinal stage with EBUS and surgery, if not in two, versus going straight to new adjuvant chemotherapy and then staging and then surgery. Next, please. And we decided to perform chemotherapy with cisplatin and pemetrexid, and we gave him four cycles. Marina, would you like to comment? No, I, I think that uh, he also, in Italy, we, I think that uh, this is a, a correct solution. There are uh, some data that suggest that the patients on chemo are at higher risk compared targeted agents and so on uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but uh, at the same time, uh, this is a type of disease that potentially you can cure. So the risk balance uh, is in favor, in my opinion, treatment, uh, although to start uh, with maybe with surgery that can be not complete uh, or, uh, or not. So I thought agree with the with your solution. Next please. He did re really well throughout the treatment and then this is the restaging chassis cloud please. Yeah, you can you can see uh, you have a couple of images there. Uh, this is in the uh, the time of the diagnosis yeah uh, I assume. Uh, yeah. And then this is, is the, the one after the chemo, chemotherapy here. So you can identify that there is a significant reduction in the volume of the lesion over 50% of the volume, all over 50% of the volume, showing that a good response to the treatment there. Uh, looking at these images, I still don't see any signs of major spinal lymphadenopathy, and there is still no obvious pleurifusion in these two images. Can you please, next image? Yeah, so we can perceive here that was more at the core of the lesion in the pre-treatment with the necrosis there. You can identify that again, even at the largest uh, axial dimension of the lesion, the tumor has reduced significantly in size. And again, no obvious uh, sign of pleural dissemination, which is very good. Yeah. Next. Next slide. Uh, on the sagittal view, you can perceive again that uh, it's, it's a very good response. You perceive some uh, bands yeah, uh, emerging from the tumor, which shouldn't be interpreted as uh, lymphangitis because this is the tumor of the as it's usually you get have some metalactic surrounding the lesion. Uh, and as the, the, the tumor shrinks, you're going to have some of these metalactic. So I wouldn't be calling this lymphangitic spread. Next slide, please. Uh, again, similar to that, you perceive that again, the costophrenic angles and the posterior chest wall is free of fluid, uh, and that again, no signs of invasion of the upper mediastinum, and there is no other evidence on this image that the patient would be showing any acute infection at the time. Next slide. The PET CT is very important. Yeah, you can perceive that there is a significant reduction in the size, not only in the size, but also in the uptake. Yeah? So it changed from the 12.6 in the preliminary examination to 3.1. And they usually use, we use the uh, cutoff point of seven to call a poor prognosis there. And this is a very, very good uh, re, uh, disease response to the treatment there. Next slide. Yep. So Thank you so much. Now, Dr. Pramesh, uh, I would ask for your um, comments after telling you that the patient four weeks later finishing the treatment was submitted to a, uh, underwent a video mediastinoscopy with frozen sections. The lymph nodes were of 4R, 4L, 7, and 8L were all negative, and he was submitted, um, he was operated by Dr. Ricardo Oliveira. 
and by Dr. Paolo Gauji and underwent an uniportal back left lower lobe phlebectomy with a wet resection of the lingula. It was, uh, he had an uneventful post-op and was discharged on, on post-op number uh, day three. So Dr. Pramesh? Uh, I, I think I would agree with this uh, uh, approach. Uh, the patients responded very well to uh, the new adrenaline chemotherapy uh, both by, by way of size as well as uh, FUV max. And uh, even the previous uh, endo the, uh, PET CT hadn't shown mediastinal nodes. So uh, a, a thoracoscopic uh, left lower lobectomy would be the right approach to take. I would just go back uh, a bit uh, and come back to the discussion that you had in your MDT and uh, uh, have this very active discussion with the patient about the options. I suspect that uh, uh, in May or uh, uh, when, when this patient is probably treated, we would probably have uh, uh, gone more on in favor of doing a uh, invasive mediastinal staging by way of an endobronchial ultrasound. And uh, if that is negative, gone ahead with primary surgery and follow it up with adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, I wouldn't argue too much with the approach that you've taken. New adjuvant chemotherapy would probably have exactly the same kind of uh, long-term outcomes, but uh, it's just as a matter of protocol that we reserve new adjuvant chemotherapy only for the uh, psychologically or uh, histologically proven uh, N2 disease. Uh, but, but happy to see that the patients responded very well to the four cycles of uh, Femetrix and Platinum. I suspect the surgery would have been a lot easier after the chemotherapy than uh, before. So uh, I wouldn't argue with that. Yeah, there was the timing of the COVID. I think that was the main issue because it was locked in the middle of everything else. People were really scared to go to the hospital. That, so, that's actually, uh, this is Graham Warren. I, that's actually a very interesting point there as well because I think this worked out. And of course, I'm a radiation oncologist. Uh, I like the approach that was taken here. But one could, if they could not have tolerated surgery, uh, radiation with chemotherapy uh, would be another option. Uh, one of the issues is that following the radiation and chemotherapy is the uh, use of dravalumab immunotherapy for a year. And with the repeated uh, exposure in clinic, you know, they have to come in for radiation for usually four to six weeks, depending on the fractionation scheme. And so the question about exposure risk for the patient and the logistics for radiation would make it difficult. So whereas that could be an option in a case like this, uh, those logistical issues could be very important to, con to consider. Um, thank you. So next, next please. So this is the final pathology report, invasive amylocarcinoma measuring five centimeters the residual viable tumor was only 0.3 centimeters, and the subtype patterns were cribriform, 80%, asinar, 15%, solid, 5%. There was uh, no lipovascularization, no pleural, no visceral pleurization, negative margins, the, the lymph nodes were negative. So um, actually, we did get a pretty good um, downsize of the tumor. Dr. Shao, would you like to comment on this? Pass report, please. Dr. Shao? I guess. Can you hear us? Yes, I was talking. Hi. Um, <laughs> It's a little bit chaotic because I'm in quarantine right now in the hotel room uh, in Guangzhou. Uh, so uh, I think this is a very successful story, uh, despite the, that we're in the pandemic and uh, the clinical decision is absolutely correct. And the final pathology report has just proven that this is very successful. Um, I have nothing to add. Okay. So Marina, I have a question for you. Um, his EGFR negative, but if he was positive, would you give him anything at this time? Can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, so I have a question for you. He's EGFR negative, but if he was positive, would you give him a emergenib following the other uh, results at this time? 
maybe, maybe that uh, maybe yes. So what we find uh, very important now in this case is uh, is uh, to um, to to do the swab. But when you do the CT scan, uh, sometimes you can find also the uh, pneumonitis, and sometimes is the, the pneumonitis in the CT scan is more accurate. Uh, that the swab that can be also potentially negative. So what we are trying to do now is to be sure that these patients are pretty clean and then to treat them as best as we can, like in this case. Thank you. So I would like to, um, we're going to go to the next case. I would like to again thank ISLC. They were great in putting all the names together and suggesting all the names. So thank you so much. This is the second case. It's a 51-year-old um, Brazilian from the Northeast, um, never smoker, who just had hypertension. Next, please. And um, she um, was diagnosed with COVID, with cough, fever, and dyspnea. She was admitted to the hospital in May of 2020. Next, please. And this is the chest CT. Paul, please. So this is a little more challenging case. So we can identify at this slide several micronodules, well defined, very dense. Some are more more tubular uh, in in, as, in aspect, and a little bit of haziness, like that you could consider as ground glass attenuation as well. So you probably have two different processes going at the same time here. Uh, it's a good inspiration in these slides. Uh, could you please pass the next one? Next image, please. Yeah. So here you can see at the level of the York arch, you can perceive that there is no significant lymphadenopathy at this level yet, but you have loads of these very dense nodules. There is no obvious pleural plaque or pleural effusion, some linear atelectasis, uh, a little bit more uh, subsegmental atelectasis or, or a denser area of confluence of those nodules. Uh, none of these is cavitated. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, at the level of the tracheal carina, you see the upper low bronchus here. The rest, uh, the, the, the remaining portion of that uh, subsegmental atelectasis you can perceive that the macronodules are widespread throughout. Uh, although you have some nodularity along the bronchopastoral bundles, as you can see along these bronchus here uh, in the right upper lobe, uh, you cannot really uh, define as a perilymphatic distribution. Looks like a perilymphatic, but you still need to call these more randomic, uh, which coming from Brazil, uh, we do need always to consider the possibility of media TB, so we would need to have more clinical information on that, uh, and sarcoidosis as cause for this. It doesn't explain the ground glass attenuation that you see elsewhere, uh, a little bit very hazy, very ill-defined, very subtle in reality, ground glass attenuation. Next slide, please. You see in the left lower lobe a large mass, which measures approximately five centimeters, judging from here, and you can perceive already that there is a little bit of thickening of the pleural or effusion here. The ground glass in the lower zones is much more obvious than in the upper zones. You can see a focus of ground glass here, uh, another one there, and a more geographically distributed ground glass attenuation down here, a little bit more focal down here. Uh, so you have a tumor, yeah, which doesn't look, to, doesn't seem to be part of the same process again. Yeah? So you possibly have three different things happening at the same time. So next slide, please. Uh, in the more the lowest portion of the lung, near the costophagic angles, you can see some areas where the lung parenchyma is spared uh, from the nodules and from the ground glass attenuation. The nodules are Predominant in the upper zones, see the much less nodules in the lower zones that you saw in the mid and upper zones, uh, and the subsegmental atelectasis in the left lower lobe, which is actually distal to that larger tumor. Uh, next slide, please. Here you can perceive the tumor. It's a more homogeneous tumor. Uh, by the size, it's very suspicious for malignancy, uh, but we can, uh, it's a patient which is from, from a country where TB has a high prevalence. There is no cavitation 
that we can perceive here, the known necrosis that you can perceive. There is a minimal effusion. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So basically, this is what you have then on the CT. Yeah. Where they also identified that was not demonstrating the image some calcified lymph nodes in the right hilum. Yeah. Uh, and nothing else uh, in addition to that. Yeah. So uh, some mediastinal nodes had a shortest diameter near the limit. Yeah. The longest diameter is above the, the user threshold of one centimeter, but what you count is the shortest diameter anyway. So uh, they are technically normal in relation to the size criteria. And the mass measure about five centimeters. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. So, okay. the patient underwent a bronchoscopy in July. Um, the right and left bronchial trees were without abnormality. There was a small volume of secretion, and he underwent a pulmonary biopsy. She underwent a pulmonary biopsy that showed malignant neoplasia with epithelioid cells and tubular patterns. Um, the bronchial wash was positive for malignant. Um, cells and the immunistic chemistry showed lung gas, asner, adenocarcinoma, CK7 positive, CK20 negative, napkinase positive, TTF1 positive, and uh, chloracinase negative, epithelial tumor, uh, glycoprotein positive. So, Dr. Shao? New to this. Uh, hi. I, again, this is a very challenging case. Um, so first of all, the biopsy showed, clearly showed a presence of an adenocarc um, lung adenocarcinoma, and uh, the immunohistochemical pattern is consistent with the primary lung uh, cancer with CT7 positive, CK20 CK negative, and uh, TTF positive, and so on. Um, however, uh, um, I think uh, at this point, the clinic, uh, I, I don't know um, if there's any surrounding tissue. Uh, I, I know the biopsy is targeting the mass. If there's any surrounding tissue that could uh, have included in the biopsy that might uh, show any evidence of um, COVID related change, that's the only question I have. Yeah. There was a uh, that was the only um, material that we had. Um, next, please. Uh, this is that CT from August, so um, two months later. So, Klaus, would you like to comment, and then we'll go back to Dr. Chow. Yeah. So, so as as I mentioned before, we have possibly two or three different processes happening here. Yeah. The ground glass could be partly due to suboptimal inspiration in the mid and lower zones, but uh, the, in the upper zones, it's very subtle. So this here is a highly suspicious for a primary lung cancer. It has a very different uptake of the other uh, micronodularities that you have there. Uh, so in, in the sense of these two things together, yeah, this could be a lung cancer. And this thing here, I wouldn't be very uh, uh, comfortable to say that this is metastasis at all. I would possibly prefer the, possibility, the, the diagnosis of sarcoid as part of the micronodularity yeah, or active micro, uh, uh, miliary TB, but a possibly sarcoid reaction in a patient with lung cancer. Uh, I, certainly, the previous examination has been mandatory here for us to be able to try to narrow the diagnosis. But uh, without any previous and without information about active signs of uh, infection, uh, this is, would, be, would be probably a lung cancer in a patient with sarcoidosis. Yeah. Next, Next slide, please. please. Uh, you can perceive again uh, that uh, the, the, the nodules have uh, this very randomic distribution, very symmetric in size, uh, uh, and that mass with a very high uptake. Nothing else really striking here on the on the coronal uh, uh, coronal views on this patient here. Yeah. Next slide. So the SP max of this was 6.8. Yeah, and the size of the lesion 
so the maximum diameter of the lesion was 5.6 centimeters, which is in the 3 t level. Yeah? Uh, so this, uh, again, the elevation the initial is light. Uh, although some of these nodules could be in a perilymphatic distribution, they have also in zones that you cannot really uh, define as perilymphatic. Uh, that's why I included basically T, my, uh, miliary TB in the differentials, although looking to that uh, uh, and to the limited history provided, I, I, I'm much more inclined to think that this is, is going to be sarcoid in the patient with the lung cancer. Next slide. No, that, that, that was the last one. So let's go back. And just, so for this case, uh, we really need help. Dr. Pramesh and Marina and everybody, Dr. Graham. Um, so would you go and do a biopsy on the contralateral, on these um, lesions, the micronodule lesions? What would you do? So I, I would... Uh look for some histological confirmation uh, of metastatic disease before I label this as metastasis. Because otherwise, uh, if, if the rest of the process is related to COVID, uh, this is a potentially curable patient, and uh, I would be reluctant to label this as uh, metastasis as this is my radiology but I'm certain about that. Um, Dr. Graham, um, Marina, would you like to comment? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part, half of uh, what Professor just said. Uh, I would support biopsy because I do think in this case it really is the inflection point behind a palliative versus definitive treatment. And a definitive treatment, we have some options, um, you know, depending on surgical possibilities versus SBRT. Um, and you can provide some pretty effective control measures. So I think the distinction of clearly metastatic disease, yes, no, would be very important in a case like this. Yeah, so Marina would like to um, make some comments and then you'll take over to present the third case, which is yours, please. Marina? Okay, so, okay, good. May I add one more or one? Sure. Can I, yeah, one more comment. So, uh, regarding the uh, suspicious sarcoidosis, uh, at this point, I think a re biopsy is uh, quite necessary um, because sarcoidosis is very easy, can be very easily reflected on biopsies from those lesions. And uh, another reason relates to my first question, earlier question, is that uh, uh, biopsying uh, lung parenchyma away from the mass um, may be a good opportunity to observe some, if there's any, um, confirm some of the histological changes that may, might re be related to COVID. Um, infection. So I think uh, as far as the, uh, I just want to re-emphasize as far as the original biopsy of the mass lesion, the immunohistochemical profile is consistent, consistent with the primary lung cancer. So um, that's, that's what I need to add. Can I yep. just ask one thing for Dr. Promet? Uh, if, uh, if these, uh, would you favor a, a transbronchial biopsy just to confirm if these are quite, or you would, would rather have an open lung biopsy of these other areas? The approach would be to do a transbronchial biopsy, and uh, we often we do get biopsy. But if that's inconclusive, then then it guided biopsy from out, from or even a flat wedge from outside. Marina, can you hear us? Um, can, would you like to present the third case, please? Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Next slide. We can. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a particular case that had in the beginning the uh, pandemic in Italy, which is a case of uh, a very young female 
with a very rare uh, histological history, with uh, oncological history, because this patient had a small cell lung cancer and uh, she was uh, uh, a never smoker. So we went, uh, we, we decided to do, although it was a small cell lung cancer, to do an NGS. And uh, we found that uh, ALK was uh, uh, but uh, during the, the, the her story, we started before uh, it was cell cancer. We started the chemotherapy and uh, immunotherapy followed by uh, immunotherapy maintenance. And uh, when she was uh, on uh, um, immunotherapy maintenance, she developed the brain mass. Uh, lung, the nodal and hepatic progressive disease. So exactly in these days, in the beginning of March, um, she had the diagnosis of COVID-19. And uh, uh, she, the patient was totally asymptomatic with a fever, cough, problems. But uh, as you can see from uh, uh, the uh, CT scan, um, in the uh, last uh, part, uh, uh, she had some sign of pneumonitis. And this was a very typical case because uh, often uh, we are called by the radiologists that when the patients are doing a reevaluation uh, uh, with the CT scan, they observe uh, this uh, sign that you can see of pneumonitis they call the oncologist and we do together the swab and the serological part if at the time it was not possible because it was March, but any time we did the swab. So if you go in the next slide, the patient was ALK positive. She was 37 with three children at home. And uh, uh, she, at the, uh, she did uh, uh, a therapy, an oral therapy for, uh, uh, the, um, for the COVID, but uh, she was totally asymptomatic, but the children became positive and the same was for the husband. So we did after two weeks uh, the second swab and the second swab was still positive. We did again after one week a third swab, and the swab was positive again. So the patient was 37 with brain mass, liver mass, and so also the cancer condition was very difficult. So although she was still positive, we decided to start alectinib. Uh, for uh, the treatment of this rare small cell lung cancer. And as you can see, the patient became a negative only three months after the diagnosis of COVID-19. And uh, you can see that we could do uh, the, the, the oral treatment with the tyrosine kinase inhibitor and uh, the patient became went in a complete remission. So if you go to the next slide, so for us, this was a very important case because the first question is that now we know that some patients remain positive to the swab for a long, long time. And we don't know if uh, in this phase we can restart or not the treatment, but sometimes, like in this case, it is very important and also life-saving uh, uh, to start something. Otherwise, maybe this patient uh, was dead. And the second point is that maybe uh, if you have to start a second line for uh, a small cell lung cancer could be different, but to start a tyrosine kinase inhibitor can be different from chemotherapy or other type of treatment. And third, I think that if we go and we think to the data recently presented in TeraVolt, the performance status of this patient is very, very important. So 
although she had the brain mass and the liver mass, so this patient uh, had the performance status uh, on of one. So at the end, uh, I know that uh, this was a very hard decision to start a treatment uh, still uh, with a COVID uh, uh, positive test, uh, but uh, I think that at the end, uh, now we have a patient in a complete remission uh, uh, and uh, she is negative, and uh, she could do the holidays. So this is the case. That's a very, very interesting case, and um, I, I agree with you. I think restarting um, treatment was the right decision because we—it's it, really hard to, to judge, you know. And some patients remain uh, PCR positive for a long time, so. Um, Dr. Pramesh, Dr. Chow, uh, Dr. Graham, um, would you like to comment? Uh, may I? Sure. Yeah, so I think that the uh, COVID positivity was determined by an RT-PCR. And uh, it is well known that uh, the RT-PCR remains possible for a long time. We can't. Are you able to hear me? Sorry? No, we, we, we hear you very far. Yeah, Pramesh, you have to go in and in. So if you could come closer, that would be great. I'm closer to the mic, please. Louder as well. So is this better? <laughs> yes. So uh, I, I assume that the uh, COVID positivity was determined by an RT PCR. And it is well known that uh, the RT-PCR remains positive for a long time, even after the, the virus. Yes, she remains positive uh, with the RT-PCR for uh, at least uh, three months. We can hear you, Dr. Uh, are you able to hear me now? Yes, now we can. Yeah. Right. So, uh, I'll try and speak a little louder. So uh, 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 one option would be to do a IgG antibody test. And uh, if the IgG antibodies are positive, it almost certainly means that the active uh, infection is no longer there. And that helps us a lot in determining whether to uh, restart anti-cancer therapy or not. Because the RT-PCR remaining positive very often is just dead viral particle uh, being picked up but because the RT-PCR is a very, very sensitive test. And it really doesn't differentiate between uh, active infection with COVID and uh, just the dead viral RNA being picked up. So uh, in these situations, we found that doing an IgG antibody test is very useful to, uh, to ensure that the active infection is over. Yeah, I, I agree. So at the time it was March, so we were just in the beginning of the pandemic and the serological tests were not available. It was just 20 days after the beginning of the pandemic. But now maybe we can do the EGM and the EGG that can be very useful, but at the same time, a swab positive, uh, we don't know really if uh, you can risk something if you still have the virus uh, in the lung. Yeah, this is actually a really tricky type of an issue uh, and one that hasn't been sorted out well in, in the literature from any evidence base and you can kind of look at you know, the need for cure versus uh, the risk of let, losing cure due to delay in some cases. At the same time, you have patients that uh, may be symptomatic versus being asymptomatic. Uh, and at the same time, you may have cancer that is causing an immediate life-threatening condition, not necessarily in this case. And right now, we're, we're, there's not a solid evidence base in the context of uh, curative versus palliative care for, uh, you know, clearly urgent uh, cancer cases versus case cancers that may be able to be delayed for a little while. Uh, it's a it's an area that that will take some time to evolve. Uh, but in the cases of people who are symptomatic, uh, you know, the risk of continued progression or worsening uh, and demise is very uh, serious concern. 
uh, for patients who are asymptomatic and maybe have a potentially curable disease. You're also faced with how do you treat this while minimizing risk of exposure to other patients, uh, cancer patients as well. Uh, so this is an example of a case where uh, you're kind of right on the edge of trying to make the decision between uh, COVID risk and logistical management versus uh, the ability to effectively treat uh, a patient. It doesn't appear in this case like this is a, an immediately life-threatening issue. So uh, I think that does afford some time for some consideration, uh, but this is a, a, unfortunately a very complex topic that, that will take some time for us to get solid evidence about how to, to make recommendations for long-term outcomes. Yeah, I agree and believe that uh, uh, in these cases uh, where the evidence is very low, we have to speak very carefully with the patient, with the family, that we don't know really what to do and to balance the risk of cancer with the risk of cancer. Yeah, that, that was a great case, Amanda. Thank you. So we do have uh, a task for Klaus. We have five minutes for him to present um, case number four. Excellent, excellent slide. So the, one of the issues that we observed during the COVID pandemic was the main problem we have with the lung biopsies and availability of scanners. It was in our hospital because for us to be able to continue to provide CT scan for the patients who are needed there, we had to clean the, the room after the patient has left the room that has reduced a lot our scanning capacity. And lung biopsies uh, proven to be a very time consuming uh, uh, in terms of the use of the scanner, not only because we need to, to protect ourselves to full uh, PFEs, uh, but also because the time for cleaning the room was actually increased because you were actually generating more uh, uh, more uh, aerosols than, than you would do if you were just doing a normal scanner without an intervention. So we try to reduce at the most of our biopsies. And uh, we've learned, uh, uh, looking at that, we've started to question which cases should we really uh, consider going to that biopsy balancing the problem that this would represent to other patients as well. So we, we were suggested by the, the national guidance that we should try to minimize the number of biopsies to those cases that we really think it would make a significant difference. So we, we have two quick, quick cases here. So this patient here is a patient with a nodule in the left upper lobe, which has been biopsied yeah, uh, pre-COVID. Yeah, so next slide, please. So you can see there is more nodule, but in the chest wall, uh, this has been repeated uh, a long later, four months later. So the, the previous biopsy was in 2019. The second biopsy was still in 2019. And the patient was being observed uh, through these things. And go to the next slide, please. And then you can perceive that this patient has actually that nodule that we have biopsy that is more peripheral in the left upper lobe, but he had another nodule, which was in the baseline scan, very parallel to the sternum uh, here, just, just medial to the sternum, sorry, uh, lateral to the sternum. Uh, as you can see in the three months, sorry, four months and seven months follow-up, the nodule has grown as well. Uh, next slide, please. And additionally, this patient had a nodule in the opposite lung, as you can see over time, uh, seven months. Next slide, please. And then on PET CT, you can perceive that uh, not only the SUV of the nodule that we have biopsy has progressed, yeah, with these two inconclusive biopsies although the need was showing inside the nodule uh, in the initial valves, the second one had a new authority, so you never know if you really got the good tissue. But it, it was not diagnosed. None of those were diagnostics. And you can see that the, nod the biopsy nodule, the nodule adjacent to the sternum, and the nodule in the right lung have all progressed in time. So the, the main question is that uh, should we uh, repeat those biopsies or uh, try to treat this patient. So it's a very, very challenging thing that I brought because it was probably not challenging just to us. I think it's challenging to everybody else in this panel, but uh, 
the main idea of this is to bring a real case where you face something that's completely out of the usual uh, uh, progression there uh, with three nodules uh, to be considered. We, we cannot really consider that these are metastases from that one, but although we could, yeah, but there was no lymphadenopathy, anything in the image. Just the next slide. And then this is basically the, the progression, yeah? So we have about 10 months delay uh, from the initial biopsy diagnosis or suspected diagnosis of lung cancer through the uh, time this patient came to the fourth MDT uh, just before the COVID outbreak. The next slide. So that is basically what I would like you, the panel, to help the uh, audience to to try to do, to see how a panel like yours uh, would uh, act in a situation like this, where you have two negative biopsies and the changes are all progressing, indicating that they are highly suspicious of primary malignancy, with possibly three synchronous primary, but of course you could argue if they were not metastatic. Yeah. Thank you. Very challenging case. Dr. Warren, please. You know, this is uh, very interesting because uh, in a case such as this, in the absence of COVID, we would likely try to do a surgical resection of one for a biopsy and try and evaluate uh, the other sides, uh, you know, so we would get a, a bit of a therapeutic biopsy is what we would call that. Uh, but we would still have to try and differentiate what was happening on the opposite side. In the case of COVID, uh, I think we you could consider the same types of, of issues uh, with regards to potential surgical resection of one site or another or, or rebiopsy. Uh, and I think that part is difficult. Uh, you know, if it was a single node, it would be fairly, uh, you know, at this point in time, we would likely discuss that it's been progressing and do definitive management if it was just a single nodule. But with having multiple nodules, that makes it much more complicated. Um, if it was a single nodule, I would note one thing from a radiotherapeutic perspective. We've actually changed a lot of our practice in the past several months to treat, you know, one or two nodules with a single fraction of radiation with very good control uh, rather than four to five fractions or, you know, three fractions. And so, uh, you know, you can treat these smaller nodules with, uh, you know, fairly minimal interventions. Uh, point being is that I think uh, trying to determine a malignancy uh, would be uh, very important. Uh, in this case, I would try and uh, get a, a, a surgical resection of a nodule because if it was metastatic, then you're just going to help direct systemic therapy for what you want to do for management. So I think that would probably be the next step for myself. Um, I, I agree. I think we need to really um, have the diagnosis cloud to be clearly progressing and we need to do something for this patient. So, um, well, it's time really passed by. It's um, five minutes to nine now and I would like to um, thank all the panelists. I think it was great. Thank, thank you so much, IFLC. A staff for putting this together with the uh, ASCO staff, which uh, you all have been great. And I would like to turn to Doug um, for his final words. Thank you. So, uh, Clarissa, thanks so much. Um, you, you took the words from my mouth. Um, but first of all, I just want to thank uh, you, Dr. Mathias, for leading this conversation so well. Uh, fascinating discussion. Thank you, all the panelists. You know, I, I, I wonder if it's just sort of a very small silver lining of this whole uh, pandemic um, period that we're able to take these moments to gather together, share expertise and perspectives, and, uh, and learn from one another. So thank you. Thank you again. Um, I, I would like to um, thank very much our friends at ISLC. This is, was a, a great collaboration. I hope not the, uh, the only, I hope the first of, of many more. Um, as you can see on the slide here, uh, ASCO and I, ISLC are working together on our quality oncology practice initiative in, in Brazil and Spain. Um, some information is there if you'd like to learn more. Um, the next slide, please. And um, again, just want to thank all of you who have joined us here today. 
taking the time out of your day to, or, or you paying to, um, to share in this discussion of, of these fascinating cases. Um, please do join us for our next one. So the next one is at the end of September, September 29th, and then a, uh, a following one towards the end of October. Um, we are um, very interested in your suggestions of topics. So we encourage you to submit recommended topics to a survey that you'll receive after this webinar. As uh, Dr. Grubbs mentioned at the beginning, recordings are on ASCA's YouTube channel. Uh, so please share those with your colleagues who are unable to join us today. Um, if you would like a certificate of attendance, you can send an email to that email address that's listed. And uh, yeah, just once again, thank you to all of you for your participation, your insights, and I look forward to seeing you again uh, next month. And please do um, take care and stay safe. And thank you.